Today, in this session, I'm very excited to do this, and I'm going to set it up here before I ask you to introduce yourself, Lanza. But um, Informatica has done something which very few companies have done. And over the last decade, several tech companies that were public have gone private. And when they went private, it was with the promise that in, hey, three years, four years, tops, five years, we're going to be a public company again. And that was a talk track for every one of these companies. Most of them, the vast majority, have never gone public again. Never. This company did. They were a public company in 99. Then in uh, 2015, they went private. And in 2021, they came back out. And so I am, it's really a great joy to, to you know, talk about that case study. And so with that, answer, just set up your role at Informatica, first of all, before we get into the discussion. Thank you for having me, John. You know, just a little bit of background of myself. I joined Informatica in 96 as an engineer in our R&D team. So I've been fortunate enough to be uh, with Informatica for 26 plus years, having done uh, building products for the first seven years or so. You know, it's the, the impact of making customers realize business value with the technology we developed, you know, kind of drew me into the post-sales role. Then I ran support, services, education, and renewals. And now I am the chief customer officer. And, uh, you know, we have done a lot over the last uh, many, many years. What I'm most excited is spending some time with you to give you a preview of what we have done in the last six years. You know, me having been in a startup, public, back to private, and now back to, we call it a re-IPO. You know, look forward to chatting with you on the last six years, what Informatica has done. Fantastic. So um, these are classic technical difficulties. I have my notes for the interview, and then went blank on my iPad. But the good news is I think I, I know the questions that I want to ask you. So I'm going to have to free will this. So the first question I, I want to put on the table, uh, and you and I have had a lot of conversations about this, is um, we write and talk a lot about the financial fish that companies face, and that's one of the reasons that they'll go private is that, you know, they, they need to retool the business, right? You wanna go from on-prem to the cloud. There's investment there, there's friction there. So my first question is, how much was the financial fish a consideration as, as the company was going private? You know, talk a little bit about the catalyst for initially going private. When we went private in 2015, long-term value creation was the driving motivation. Mm -hmm. for us in the field of data management. We knew we had the opportunity to build out the next generation data management product of the cloud. Over the last six years, we have invested more than a billion dollars doing just that. And uh, we have launched the intelligent data management cloud. And for that investment of that scale, going private was the right approach. Mm -hmm. Not only we built the next generation cloud data management product, in the process, we also grew our addressable market fivefold. Mm -hmm. Our addressable market now is north of $40 billion. And uh, I have to emphasize the scale of this. It is a multi-year journey. Now, just to give some milestones, you, you highlighted that we went private in 2015. In 2017, we started our journey to be a subscription company. We launched our first version, first version of our data management cloud. In uh, 2020, we started going from license, then subscription, then into the consumption go-to-market. Yeah. So uh, this is a two-in-one transformation in, in some ways. Mm -hmm. Now, then we went uh, IPO in uh, 21, and uh, we now offer uh, a go-to-market, which is cloud-only for the most part. Mm -hmm. You know, having been in the industry for a long time, I'm sure uh, most of you can uh, relate to the fact building a new category or disrupting a category is very rare. And uh, being able to build it out to a billion dollars is even more rare. And that's exactly what Informatica has done. And so when you, and again, as you go into this journey, you know that there's gonna be 
some big investment required, right, to do to do that, right, to pivot the business model, to build out the new category. Part of what I heard there is you, you had to clearly maximize revenues from the existing portfolio. You had to make sure you're getting everything you can out of that. Um, what are some of the other tactics that you, you know, levers that you pulled to, again, navigate that financial fish? Any other, any other things that were helpful there? When we went private, uh, Informatica was fortunate uh, that we had our on-prem data management business, which was very profitable. Mm -hmm. We were able to leverage that profitability to build out the cloud portfolio and the operating system, operating system required mm -hmm. to build out this uh, transformation. Now, to double click on that, we said we wanted to ensure this maintenance business. We continue to renew that at a very high rate. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we still renew that at, in the mid 90s. Yeah. Uh, we have kept that very steady, you know, uh, pivoting to the cloud at making sure we serve value to our customers on the on prem business with that renew. So that worked out pretty well. Then we ensured that the sales team slowly pivoted to selling the cloud. Uh, we didn't shut down sales of uh, on prem products. Yep. It was a slow, deliberate, planned transition. Yeah. And then we had to go out to build out the systems, which was the hard part. <laughs> uh, you know, like I said, I want to give you a preview of what happened behind the scenes the last six years. The systems part, which was a multi-year journey, to build out a system for subscription, which will give all the KPIs for the annual recurring revenue business mm -hmm. was very key. What we did very early on, I think, uh, which played a very important role in this transition was we converged all our post-sales offerings into one. Mm -hmm. So that, that really uh, played out uh, very well as well. So these are the, some of the things we did uh, to kind of your words, tactics, yeah. to, uh, navigate through the yeah, so So again, just playing back to the things I heard, and I think one really important point for folks in the audience that may be facing a business model transformation, and this is something that JB and I worry about a lot, is, is what we call the manana strategy, where you're like, okay, hey, we'll work on that next year, or you know, not right now. But the problem is if you run out of a runway from revenue and margin from the current portfolio, you, it's harder to fund the transformation and what you articulated there is that was really important to still have runway left right. right with the second thing you put on the table is the fact that it was a you know a controlled burn it was it was not the adobe model or the autodesk model where hey we're going to you know go really fast into the new business model um, we're going to basically you know control that you know pace of change what, you know, when, what percentage of customers we want to move over, which it can absolutely be a winning strategy as well. And we've, talked, we've written about this. You don't have to do this business model transformation in a flash. Um, and, and so that's important. The other thing you, you put on the table, and you and I talked about this in terms of, because I had asked you beforehand, what was you know, one of the, the work streams that was, uh, or, or you know, one of the things you had to do that took more time and treasure than anticipated and it was harder, and you, you said systems. You said that that, was, that is a big, you know, having the systems to support the new business model. And I, I hear that, I heard this in the executive you know, advisory board meeting um, on, on Monday. So, so that is a, is a real um, challenge. I, any specific things as you were getting through the systems not hold that you would recommend people to think about? What, what were some of the winning, the, you know, the winning approaches there? You know, some of the business levers we did was, you know, I think I, I like to name maybe four or five, right? I mean, uh, before I uh, get into the systems part of it, one was around sales compensation. Now, we had to ensure the sales team was compensated as they were selling both on-prem and cloud products, mm -hmm. right? So we, we had a mixed model business. And were you one. equally you they could sell either one and they were equally compensated or did you have a, a preference on one? Yeah, so uh, we kind of started uh, juicing up compensation more for the cloud yeah. over time. So that kind of gave a natural shift. It also helped us manage the investment to fund some of the cloud portfolio as well. Yeah. 
And uh, secondly, the shift in R&D spending. Like I said, our, our goal was to preserve the renewal rates and to make sure customers continue to realize value for the on-prem portfolio. How do you shift the R&D spending so that you balance both those objectives? Yeah. And third is obviously uh, the, the systems. You know, you, how do you build out the systems which uh, will give an end-to-end -end view and uh, you know, we, did, we didn't have a true subscription management system. Right, right. You know, uh, net new business was disconnected from renewals. Mm. So in 2016, Informatica, you know, as with most enterprise companies, do a lot of business north of 80% from existing customers, you know. Goes back to the land and expand portfolio. Those days, selling to an existing customer on subscription we had to do a credit and rebuild of the new business to even make it work because wow. the systems were yeah, yeah. disconnected. Yeah. And uh, we had four different systems handling renewals. Wow, geez, yeah. You know, how do you bring them all together so that we can amend the contracts and co turn them? That, that, that was part of the multi year uh, journey we talked about. Yeah. Yeah, and the and, and again in terms of just time from when you, that you started that journey to say we we've got to redo these systems to where you got to the point where you really were you know comfortable and the systems were supporting the new business model, you know I know that that was in quarters I know it's years but just rough a rough time zone or length there what do you think how long does that take three plus years yeah, yeah. this was definitely uh, three plus years yeah yeah and I. You know, I hear so many of, of our members say, you know, talk about this challenge, and they're like, well, you don't understand, you know, how bad our systems are, right? They kind of always start with that, that, that you, you know, we're really, really have problems here. I was talking to a member yesterday, and they said, Thomas, we can't even track the difference between new revenue and renewal revenue at all. It's just revenue in our company, right? But I would assert that you're in the same boat as everybody else. I mean, you, you guys had none of the, you know, the, the capabilities you needed, but you've got to get on the journey. You've got to start chipping on it. And it's going to take multiple years, and it's going to take time and time, you know, treasure. And a couple of other things I want to highlight. By design, we decided we're going to do annual upfront contracts mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to doing monthly billing. You know, this helped us to uh, mitigate the cash flow impact. Yeah, you know when we offered our products for subscription, you know uh, we pushed and uh, for uh, two-year contracts. Yeah, yeah, and so, that, that was very key uh, for us to keep that. Uh, yeah. you know you talk about the fish and uh, you know how do you, you know is, is it flattened? Uh, right. How do you flatten the fish? How do you flatten the fish? And for those of you that aren't familiar with this particular move, and we published a paper on this, it's called "Swallowing Half the Fish." And, and, and what you're articulating, we're seeing you know, more and more software companies do, which is, which is not a bad move, is you have all these on-prem customers and you flip them to a subscription pricing model. And like you said, and, and you get them annual upfront, you can bring you know, cash in to help fund. Um, but, but, I just published uh, an article called The ARR Trap. Um, what you have to be careful is, you know, you're going to suddenly have all of this ARR, annual recurring revenue, because you flipped everybody to subscription. That's great. If you're a public company and you're talking to the street, they're excited. You're pointing to this ARR. But you still have to swallow the second half of the fish, which is you have to move those on-prem customers to true cloud. And what you're seeing is some software companies... Um, weren't doing what you're, you were doing is you were taking that money and you're, you're building the cloud, building the cloud, getting the capabilities so you can move customers there, right? Some people are, are sitting on top of that ARR and they don't want to make that investment. And they're saying, look, I'm a, I'm a you know, subscription business. Everything's good. And meanwhile, their data technology on-prem, they're falling behind. Now they have to invest. And so now OI starts going down. Now an investor starts saying, well, well, wait a minute, what's going on? So if you swallow half the fish, and you just change the pricing model. You got to jump on it in terms of the investment piece of it. I, I said that earlier. You know, you, you heard uh, JB talk about uh, yesterday. That is definitely an opportunity to monetize monetize the services part of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, as we launched uh, this cloud portfolio, we brought all of our service offerings, rationalized them. 
we had uh, offerings based on functions, professional services, customer support, education. We rationalized them to one paid offering. Yeah. We were offering 17 different flavors before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we brought them, uh, consolidated them into one. Yeah. One common theme uh, which is very important for any company going through a transformation is simplification. Mm -hmm. Bringing all these flavors into one and compensating the field to sell it was definitely a big value creation for Infant yeah. yeah. And it definitely helped us to fund the investment and make the transformation to subscription as well. Yeah. So, so let's talk about organizational structure, and, and this is an important theme around simplification, right? And, and so what you said there, which is really critical, again, if you're going through a business model transformation and you have you know, professional services and education services and customer success and support and all this stuff, trying to operate this you know, completely separately as you build this thing out, what you said is, A, we're gonna rationalize the offers. We're not, we're not gonna have everybody flinging all this stuff around. We've gotta simplify that. And we are gonna basically, what we call services convergence, we are gonna bring these organizations together. So talk a little bit about about that, of just bringing everybody into you know, sort of the big C customer success posture. You know, as we went through this transformation, you know, uh, from a company perspective, this, this was a transformation at the company level. It was not just the post sales functions going on a transformation, mm -hmm. although they had an important role to play. We, ha we had the entire company in a transformation zone. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that served us uh, two purposes. One, as we were uh, offering mixed model, both on-prem and uh, the cloud portfolio, it, it helped us to manage the, the financial aspect of it. Two, it helped us align our strategy and vision of our transformation to subscription to customers' interests as well. Mm -hmm. So this definitely helped us to accelerate our uh, subscription uh, business model. I'll kind of share the numbers towards the end. So now we have a best-in-class cloud portfolio for data management. As we bring up new services on this portfolio, we are, uh, you know, what you refer in your paper called uh, dispersed incubation. Mm -hmm. We are trying out uh, product-led growth. Mm -hmm. uh, we are trying out a few other flavors yeah. as well. Yeah. Now, on the post-sale side, like I said, we had to align all the functions into one. Yeah. And uh, with, with the singular purpose of driving value and outcome for our customers, that that's what uh, we did in the process as well. And then, and I've heard you speak before, sort of that pivot from a, a service mentality to a success mentality, right? And with that, and I mean, talk a little bit, was there a lot of angst or gnashing of teeth from those different organizations when they came together? Or, did, or, or, were, or were people realized that, hey, this is the right, the right move? What do you think the temperature was of the organization when you initially made that pivot from service to success and brought all those functions? And just taking it a step further, uh, from a, a company perspective, this is an end-to-end -end transformation, mm -hmm. right? It starts with products, go to market, pricing and packaging, customer success, and the back office functions, mm -hmm. IT, finance, legal. This, this is a complete end-to-end -end transformation. Now, like I said, when we started this transformation, we didn't, we didn't have a subscription management system. Mm -hmm. Now sitting back and uh, thinking what we have done in the last six years, we have better appreciation of what we have done as opposed to looking at it on a day-to-day -day basis. You really don't see the magnitude yeah. of what we have done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, you, know, you don't see the scars on my back on the scars on my team's mm -hmm. back. Yeah. But uh, it, it was a hard journey. And uh, to the extent sometimes it feels like ERP implementation of an ERP system is easier than quote to cash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as you make, uh, you talked about the systems, right? Making this transition, you know, to go from 
the old model to new model is hard the, the gravity in the old model will bring you back to the old ways because that's one which is paying the bills yeah yeah you cannot just what we learned is you cannot build your way through from the old model to the new model mm -hmm. you, you have to redesign it from scratch yeah and uh, one other thing which informatica did is we went all cloud within the enterprise as well today we did not have a singular on prem system in the company mm -hmm. for a mid sized company we have a number of systems yeah uh setting up a a cloud system is easy but being in a position uh to unlock the value of the data is very very critical mm -hmm. and so having a data management strategy is is super important yeah yeah good thing for us we know of a company <laughs> which has best in class yeah. to do that exactly what we did so the 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 lesson there was you have to measure and report what matters mm -hmm. when you report you know what you can improve yeah and when you improve that drives growth so that reflected in the rapid growth of the subscription business and uh the next one is when you have a cloud portfolio every interaction you have with the customer is recorded yeah yeah that telemetry today we process about 38 trillion transactions being able to take that data and couple it with our back office systems we were able to unlock a lot of opportunities to upscale our customer experience mm -hmm. uh, you heard JB talked about you know his TSA has talked about layer for a number of years you have introduced AP now mm -hmm. yeah i'll give you one example so analytics and placement is is something you know uh, today when we can close a deal in a matter of hours we can predict the propensity of the deal to renew mm -hmm. with about 80% accuracy using ai wow and uh, he talked about warm leads so this what we call a deal grade is now handed off to the csm team so they know what playbook to run yeah yeah i mean that i mean that that's fantastic and and again just playing back the, the things to really be thinking about so a i'm changing my systems i'm getting into more of a cloud posture as i'm doing that but unless i am really leveraging the data in those systems it doesn't set me up you know for for really the full value and what is that full value it is using analytics right. to basically really be much more that's sophisticated scale. that gives you scale. scale and be way more sophisticated about what revenue you're chasing how you know how you know that how good that revenue is going to be all that kind of stuff so yeah that's i think that's important and again that is the future of how we're going to manage these businesses i don't think there's any any doubt about that um i definitely want to click into customer success because i know that you know you're passionate about that and and like many companies you know it becomes a new capability that you have to nurture so first question i have on that is you know as you're going through this journey roughly when did you establish customer success i think we incubated that function in 2015 okay uh we had so right when you were going same year you were, you were going private. just around that time okay. you, yeah. you maybe a year prior to that okay it was segmented just for our cloud portfolio where we had uh base data management capabilities okay. for uh application integration so you wrapped it around the newer offers you know? just it was most on a incubation kind of a phase yeah. it was not uh mainstream mm -hmm. and uh subsequently when uh we decided to go through a business model change to subscription it was quite evident uh we didn't have to make a strong case for investment which i still do by the way but mm -hmm. uh you know the the need given that we are an enterprise complex product you know definitely the need for customer success to orchestrate the technical journey mm -hmm. for customers to realize value was pretty evident yeah mm -hmm. and uh we started scaling out that function now in the grand scheme of things as informatica pivoted from 
a license model to a ratable subscription model within the world of customer success we went through a transformation of our own mm -hmm. and that the first one was unification of services i talked about yeah. we were organized more functionally uh, we unified all the services and uh, that was one big leg of that too second is we had a great self service platform we embarked on a journey to bring in ai ml to make it truly digital with uh, ai powered that was the second uh, stool of the journey and third is in in my capacity as a chief customer officer i'm also renewable uh, responsible for renewables mm -hmm. what we evolve that function to move towards adoption and expansion as well yeah. so today that the customer success and the renewal team play a very different role in not only driving adoption but also to look for opportunities around expansion as well mm -hmm. and that was a perfect setup as we moved into the consumption go to market the uh, so again play, playing back so, so incubated around the initial cloud offers as you go to more subscription you put more investment in in cs type resources because you want to make sure that you're you know these these are going to renew and then this big digital lever so you're saying ai and self service and and that so the customers but you can drive adoption through the the self service and ai itself so so okay fantastic and then the commercials piece of it so you have renewal specialists who own who just focus on the renewal and the csm next to them the csm driving adoption or does the csm sometimes have commercial responsibility what's the relationship between those two capabilities as we are uh, re redefining the model in the world of consumption we are yeah. definitely looking at uh, csm uh, own yeah. the sacred nrr metric yeah 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 jointly with sales yeah okay so so sales still has some some uh, involvement in some compensation around making sure that the renewal happens that's that's the direction we are okay heading towards yeah now uh, the the renewal team does programmatic uh, and uh, more lead oriented uh, upsell at time of renewal mm -hmm. now we have incubated a separate expansion team uh, which does it outside of renewal so that was my next my next follow up question on the expansion responsibilities is that within the customer success organization that they're focused on helping to identify not sales but in customer Correct. success but they do closely partner with sales mm -hmm. yeah. interesting and the sales compensation model is the sales team still gets paid on that as well. yeah yeah interesting those are some of the levers we'll have yeah. to see how it evolves down the, down the road and it, the expansion focus is is it the the primary csm that now has will have that charter or is it a specialist an expansion specialist that's part of customer success currently it's an expansion specialist it is okay oh interesting okay so they and they're working with the csm and correct around the account okay yeah. what it, i mean it's so i'm going to throw him a couple curveballs here so so i'm curious the um as you describe that landscape what is your thoughts on the future of 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 this customer success skill set because one thing that i'm hearing and you're the perfect guy to ask this cuz this is the chair you're sitting in right you got to navigate this is you know we we go we're going from a world where cs was absolutely focused on adoption right and there's a skill set there um and now we're going more and more into a world where a csm does need you know more what i will call uh, you know sales type skills but and i've you know had this discussion it's a different type of selling it's process driven it's data driven right it's it's selling won't help help you know helping will will sell and so it's it's a different it's not a traditional account executive skill set so so what what do you see as the future profile of of the uh, of the skills in the customer success organization what's that look like is you you're going to hire good question thomas you know um in the world of consumption one could say that the role of sales and customer success the lines are very blurred yeah yeah you know uh one of the main uh, initiatives we have for 2023 is what is the operating model between sales customer success and products mm -hmm. in the world of consumption as you can imagine you know transformation projects at this scale the success of it is dependent on 
having executive alignment and support. Mm -hmm. I think to your question, the question before the leadership team is, how do you make that cultural shift so the company operates with the consumption mindset? So what is that definition of that mindset? Mm -hmm. What is the role of CS in that? Some of our products are complex. There's a school of thought we need to have technical folks. There's a school of thought we need to have folks who can sell. Mm -hmm. So we're trying out both. Yeah. And uh, in, the, in the world of CS as well, we do have specialists, you know, uh, who can, uh, it's just not the technology, right? Yeah. I think uh, what, what we try to say is, how do you, CS orchestrates a journey of, how do you bring the uh, promise of technology which maps to customers' outcomes? No. It, it, is, it is a hard job. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think this is, you know. There's no one size yeah, yeah. Fall answer here. Yeah, and, and so I mean, uh, but I, I think that, you know, we really are going to see an evolution of the skill sets that exist in the CS organization. You know, more, um, you know, as people talk about it, sort of the consultative skills that you would see in PS, you know, more project management type of skills. Um, but again, it's not going to be the traditional sales profile that, you know, that's going to, I think, be a winner there. Um, it was interesting in one of the breakouts yesterday, I, I heard the CRO from Gainsight uh, talking uh, a little bit about this, you know, this who owns the customer problem, right? Like you said, we we have to we have to rethink this handshake between sales and customer success. And so he said, you know, we have you know, everyone has this debate: who owns the customer? Is it the sales executive? Is it now the CSM? And he said at Gainsight, he said exactly what we say at TSIA, and that is the the Gainsight owns the customer and the process owns the customer, right? And so that I think is the winning mentality for companies is, is they're figuring out these engagement models between the two. If you're debating, wait, 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 who's, who is the primary owner? That's the wrong debate. It should really be, you know, it, it, you know the company owns the, the customer and we're gonna have, we are trying to engineer the best, most effective customer engagement process, right, to, to, to work that. You know, so that, that, is, that goes back to what I highlighted earlier as a consumption mindset, right? So in the world of post sales, you know, uh, our orchestration was what uh, we kind of, even that was a, a multi-year journey. Mm -hmm. And in phase one, we kind of uh, unified the services. We embarked on the digital experience path. Phase two was, we now have a framework, what we call a purchase to value. Mm -hmm. To your point of uh, who wants the customer. You know, who's responsible for taking the customer from the time they make a purchase till the time I realize the value. There are multiple functions right. within Informatica which have to play a role. Right. So we have a framework on it. We have a framework that does take time to align all the functions to play their role in, in that journey. Yeah. Now the phase three of it, which we are on today, is in the world of conception, how, how things change. Yeah. As we went through this transformation, we did something for the world of consumption. We now offer a simplified pricing, what we call as the Informatica processing units. Mm -hmm. Customers could buy Informatica processing units and similar to your subscription credits in yeah. TSI, mm -hmm. and they could avail any of the services we offer on the IDMC, mm -hmm. Data Management Cloud okay. Platform. Now, as sales teams make a land investment and sell IPUs, there are going to be times they're going to size it right. There are going to be times where we could oversell. Yeah. And in the scenarios where we sell more, mm -hmm. if customers want to try a new service, there is an emerging need of a pre-sales consultant in post-sales as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Whose job is it? Mm -hmm. Do the CSAs in the CS world do it? You know, to maintain customer continuum, do we bring pre-sales back? Mm -hmm. They're not going to get comped. The sale has already been made. Yeah, yeah. 
that's the, that's the phase three we are on now. And the catalyst there, again, is this, this, uh, this ongoing journey, right? Now there's this pivot from just subscription to actual consumption-based. And now we've got to make sure that the consumption is actually happening. Right. Yeah, so, so it yeah. creates a new set of issues. Yeah, and in the world of services, you know, um, you know, we're part of the professional services board, uh, Randy, who's on my team. Mm -hmm. And we're looking to see how we can offer our service offerings on consumption basis. Mm -hmm. These service offerings are all outcome driven, mm -hmm. you know, architecture reviews, first value packages. So that's, that's the transformation on the post sale side as well. Yeah. And in, in your point of view, in terms of consumption based pricing, because we are now witnessing a lot of software companies raising their hand and saying, I, I want to do that, right? And the underlying catalyst, right, is if it's per user pricing, and, and let's say that you know you have your sales force and you have a, a sell to somebody who has 100 salespeople and, and all of them have a, you know, a, a subscription, then you're done, right? There's no more revenue there. And the hope is if I go to consumption-based pricing, I can actually, there, there might be more revenue there, right? So people are, are very excited about it. First question is, I mean, do you think that is gonna be the future of software type pricing that you'll, that, that will be very, very common for people to go to consumption-based pricing or is it gonna be an edge case? The fundamental premise is all about driving value. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, driving value, continue to innovate your product portfolio mm -hmm. is, is gonna be, has to be a constant. Yeah. You know, and uh, then a lot of stuff is beyond our control, the macro and all that stuff, right? But I think, I think the world of consumption is here to say, customers want that flexibility. Yeah, yeah. Customers, Gone are the days where you make upfront investments and they're locked into fixed units of our products. Yeah. They, want, they want that flexibility uh, to go from, uh, to use multiple services. Yeah. You know, you know that, I think product innovation is key. You know, uh, having offerings around which accelerates outcome mm -hmm. and adoption is key. And if done perfectly, it does reduce the need for having to trigger a new sales process every time a customer is interested in a service. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, that is key. You know, you heard uh, JB touch on it, right? Mm -hmm. If you're gonna embark on a new sales process end to end, from discover to close, yeah. for every time customer wants to consume a service, yeah. we're not gonna be able to scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you said a very important thing there in terms of the focus around value. So even if it's consumption-based pricing, you've got to be anchoring that consumption around some type of value conversation. Right. And, it's, and it's interesting because I have talked to members who have been on, have consumption-based models for a while, and, they, and, and, and quickly the customer starts asking that question, go, okay, yeah, I'm consuming, and maybe I'm consuming more because my bill's gone up, but what's the value? You know, so you've got to be ready to connect that. It's, the win is not just to get customers to, you know, into a consumption model. You have to ultimately be anchored on value. All the more highlights that the role of customer success in the world of consumption, yep. it was even bigger than in the role of world of subscription. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's even bigger. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and I, I keep, you know, one word you've used several times uh, in this discussion is we, we had to simplify. We had to simplify this. We had to simplify that. And, you know, in the last book, we make this assertion that complexity kills. Right. So, I mean, I think that, you know, to get the models to work, <laughs> they cannot be overly complex, whether it's the pricing model, whether it's, you know, whatever. I mean, you, you really do have to be working hard to, to, to wring that out. As much as you have the operational complexity, systems, mm -hmm. product innovation, you know, uh, th these are uh, work streams which are hard. Uh, the, the thing which I'm sure the other leaders in Informatica will agree, which took a lot longer time uh, than we anticipated was uh, change management. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All the more highlights the importance of simplicity. Yeah. As, as the company was growing, you have a number of new people coming in. Mm -hmm. Like you said, they're, they're joining us at a point in time in the transformation. You know, how do you do change management? Mm -hmm. Especially when you are changing the product portfolio from on-prem to cloud. Yeah. You're changing the go-to-market from license to subscription to consumption. Yeah. Change management is hard. Yeah. And... Uh, 
and to in the context of this mixed board is is very key you know uh i was pretty fortunate to have a fabulous team uh which had the strategy right which was executing well and which is still executing very well my job was just to remove roadblocks yeah right and to burst the resistance pockets yeah that's all my job was yeah and uh which is critical you know in again when you have this much change going on and you know you you're aware we wrote this paper on the seven work streams of as a service transformation and you and I were have this conversation so if we just kind of as we close here bring back the lens the order of magnitude of this change you know you talked about we had a work, we had a work stream you know around systems we had a work stream around offer rationalization we had a work stream around organizational structure we have a work stream around um the sales and and service handshake i mean how many work streams do you think were were in play over in again a, over a multi-year period just to help people understand you know how much was was going on i think we definitely had a work stream around uh building our cloud portfolio mhm and then uh we had a work stream around uh sales mm mm-hmm. uh we had built out sales specialists when we were launching our crowd products mm-hmm. which were augmenting the sales team initial delivery initial delivery was the team in post sales mm-hmm. how do you double down and maniacally focus on driving value for customers mm-hmm. engagement models adoption models yeah. that yeah. was key and then building out all the systems around integrating all the touch points yeah so those were those were uh, those i think there were four to five uh, work streams yeah so um so, so we actually I'm excited informatica agreed to collaborate on a on a white paper about this journey and it's going to be available it's released today everybody in the audience can get it and some of the things that we talked about here today are in there and some more details um and you know your entire executive team participated and reviewed it so I'm, i'm just very grateful that they uh put that on the table for everybody out there that's going through it because it is a the real deal the, i mean and it is a a proven you know this is a success story and again we have not seen this very often companies being able to go private and come back out the, the way that you Maybe guys can share a few data points yeah let's let's hear it yeah i guess i was saving the best for the last you know reflecting on the last 6 years like i said uh to create a category is rare but to achieve a billion dollars is even more rare when we went uh, private in 2015 a subscription revenue was less than 100 million dollars mm-hmm. now you know I'm, we're very proud as a company we are very close to a billion dollars mm-hmm. so we have arr growing you know based on our uh, last quarterly financial results we have our uh, arr growing at about 16% mm-hmm. our subscription arr growing about uh, 30% and most importantly our uh, cloud arr growing uh, 42% wow fantastic uh, you know there's a lot of work to get to there. sit down with you yeah. <laughs> and kind of reflect back on that it dawned on me we have done a lot as a company yeah yeah definitely and uh, the job is not done we, we still have unfinished business yeah. yeah how do you take how do you continue this momentum in the world of consumption yeah maybe you'll have me back in a few years yeah that would be great well i i would say congratulations on where you are in the journey for right now you, i think you should feel feel good and again i'm i'm very grateful that you're willing to share the experience with the broader you know community here because they can really benefit from the from the case study. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you Thomas. Thank you.